Hello there. Suppose I have a particle subject to conservative forces such that its total energy E is conserved. That is, I can write out this energy E as equal to the particle's potential energy plus the particle's kinetic energy at any location Q. Let me be more clear on what Q is. Q is a generalized coordinate. Okay, so Q could be a lot of things. It could be the particle's X position, a Cartesian coordinate, you know, a radial position R, an angle theta, or something else entirely. But the point is, we're somehow able to track the particle's location with some coordinate Q. And depending on that location, the potential energy of the particle, it can change, sure, it's a function of Q, and the particle's kinetic energy could also change. However, the total energy of the potential plus the kinetic energy must be conserved, it must be a constant. And so what I can do is I can draw out an energy diagram. And so what I do is I put this coordinate Q on the x-axis here, and I have some general term energy here on the y-axis. Why am I just putting energy on the y-axis? Because we're going to be putting down multiple energy curves. Let's suppose my particle has some arbitrary potential energy curve, something like this, right? So this is my particle's potential energy as a function of Q. And that's defined by the nature of the conservative forces in the problem. So if someone says that my total energy of my particle, okay, is some E, okay, I'm gonna call this some E, right? And this E is a constant then we're immediately able to read out what our particle's kinetic energy is going to be at any location. So for example, let's go ahead and say that I'm, you know, at this location, I'll call this QI. Okay, then my particle's kinetic energy is going to be this height difference, right? Because, okay, just quickly rearrange this equation here, my kinetic energy at this location, Q sub I, is going to be equal to, you take your total energy E minus our potential energy at our location Q sub I, right? And so that difference is going to be this height here. Next, at this same total energy E, let's suppose that I tried to claim that I could put my particle at this location Q sub J. Well, look, now there's a problem. At Q sub J, my kinetic energy at Q sub J, which is going to be equal to E minus U at Q sub J, look, the total energy E, this is lower, this is less than the potential energy at Q sub J. This difference here is going to give me a negative value, okay? And that's not physical. My particle can't have a negative kinetic energy. So this location Q sub J here is inaccessible because my particle simply doesn't have enough total energy to allocate so much of it into this potential energy. All right, and so now that we've gone through those exercises, we can very clearly see that the accessible locations for my particle are when my total energy E is greater than or equal to the potential energy of my particle. Right, because those are the spots where if I take that difference, E minus U, those are going to give me positive values for my kinetic energy, or zero. You can also have zero kinetic energy, in which case your particle is completely still. Okay, right, and so in this diagram here, then we clearly can see that in this region here, between I'll call this Q1 and Q2, then my energy is always greater than right? This energy is always greater than or equal to the potential energies. And so this range here, this is the accessible range for my particle. Well, what do you know? It almost feels like if I'm in a potential energy valley just like this, if my total energy is within a valley, that's stable. My particle can only live within the positions Q1 and Q2. And in fact, it's going to oscillate between Q1 and Q2. Think about it, right? What's going on at these points here, at these intersection locations? These are the spots where my particle's kinetic energy is equal to zero, right? 
because my total energy E is equal to my particle's potential energy. And then at this potential energy minimum, right, that's going to be my maximum kinetic energy, right? Because that's where this difference here is the greatest, right? And so what this is effectively showing is that these intersection locations here, these are the turnaround points for my particle, right? It zips through at its fastest speed at the potential energy minimum, then slows down as it moves towards, you know, one of these turnaround points loses all of its kinetic energy and it's got oh i've got all this potential energy here and then it gets converted back zips through at this location here and then it restores it in more potential energy slows back down and so the particle oscillates back and forth back and forth all right let's put the full story together emphasizing potential energy minimums let's say that i'm in the lab and i put my particle down at the location of this potential minimum. I'll call this Q naught. So I come in and I place the particle there. That means I haven't given the particle any kinetic energy. So my total energy E sub I here is going to be tangent to this minimum spot. And so my particle can only stay at rest at this potential energy minimum. Next, I deliver some energy, call this delta E1 to the particle. Maybe I give the particle some sort of a flick. I flick the particle. By flicking the particle, I've effectively increased its total energy. And so now it has access to more area, right? It's going to oscillate between now this Q1 and this Q2. That's stable. So even though I made my particle's total energy jump from EI to E final one here, it's still constrained within these well-defined values of Q. But there's a limit to this stability. Maybe if I flick the particle again, I deliver another energy burst, delta E2. Now my particle makes it to this total energy E final two. You know, and let's keep things simple. Let's go ahead and say that Q can take on values from minus infinity to infinity. Say it's in X position, right? Depending on the actual coordinate of Q, that's going to change the possible values that Q can take. A radial distance can only take values from zero to infinity, etc., etc. But let's say Q can take on values of minus infinity to infinity, and the curve ultimately does something like this, okay? where the curve flatlines out as you move to plus infinity and to minus infinity. Then the interpretation is super duper clear here. Then the particle is able to escape not only this one specific well here, but it's actually able to continue traveling to Q equals either minus infinity or Q equals plus infinity. Depends on the direction of the flick. So this potential energy well here was, you know, it was stable to an extent. But if we delivered a strong enough flick, we're able to get the particle out of there. So that's what people mean when they say a potential energy minimum is stable. From the equilibrium location defined by the potential energy minimum, that for relatively small perturbances, the particle will remain trapped within the potential energy valley. Of course, this argument here in this video for very nice simple visualization, I only have this potential energy as a function of a single coordinate Q. Of course, your potential energy function could be, you know, a function of multiple coordinates. If it's a function of two coordinates, then your potential energy curve would turn into a potential energy surface, and your energy line here would turn into an energy plane, etc, etc. And of course, I've been using this argument of just having one particle. This kind of analysis is far more general for systems of particles, for thermodynamics. So as long as you understand the principles in this video for a single particle, you'll be able to understand analogous situations for more complex problems. But anyways, if you enjoyed this video, let me know in the comments and consider subscribing to the channel if you're not already subscribed. I love to hear about people getting on board. But other than that, thank you so, so much for watching.